stream the, uh, the grace, mercy, and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Today we look at what thoughts we can glean from Psalm 27 today. Please join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, you help us to see your beauty in scriptures. You help us to see your beauty in life, even through the times of trials and sorrows. As we continue, O oh Lord, to grow in our relationship with you, Help us to continue, therefore, to see how you are with us to the end of the age in all circumstances, not just in times of joy, but also in times of sorrow. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, most of us are all familiar with the genie legend, correct? If a genie ever appears in your life, you get three wishes. Today in Psalm 27, King David would not ask for three, he would just ask for one. Did you see the one wish he asked for in Psalm 27? We're going to look at that here shortly. We understand Psalm 27 is written by King David. He had a track record with God, and he was very, very confident in his relationship with the Lord. In Psalm 27, 1, he makes it very clear that the Lord is his light and his salvation, and he has no one to be afraid of. That's because throughout his history, he's seen divine protection from God. When his enemies and his adversaries were out to get him, it was those that stumbled and fell. He came out smelling like a rose. Notice, David talks about his own personal enemies, not the enemies of the nations of Israel. My adversaries, my enemies, my foes. Who could these people be? Throughout the life of David, we understand two people that were Always after him, one was Saul, the one who he succeeded as king. And the other one that turned against him was his own son Absalom. So you can pick your choice when David writes this. Either he is being persecuted by Saul, or he may be persecuted by his own son Absalom, both of them seeking his life. What David had going for him was this relationship with God that whenever God, when he ever asked anything of God, God would give him an answer. Wouldn't we like that relationship? All the big decisions in David's life, he went and asked God of what should he do. I want to just give a couple examples of that. In 1 Samuel chapter 24, David is on the run from Saul, but in the meantime, there are villages under attack by the Philistines. David wants to know what he should do. He has a ragtag army of about 600 people. Should he go and protect these people in the city of Keilah from the Philistines? Will God give him victory? Will it be a problem for him to do this? and still stay alive from Saul? What should he do? I love the way Samuel writes this out as David inquired of the Lord. Inquired, he asked. Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And then what's really beautiful about it is the Lord gives him answer. The Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will give you the Philistines into your hand. So David went there and gained the victory. While he was there, a priest showed up to join his army. What happened to this priest's family is an atrocity. King Saul on the pursuit of trying to find David, went to these priest's family and asked, where is David? Because we know you've been assisting him. They were not much help to Saul. So Saul killed them all. 
Every one of them, except one escaped. One escaped, and he brought the prized ephod. The ephod was this outer garment that the high priest wore with a breastplate, as you can see, 12 stones, each stone representing one tribe of the Israelites. But underneath the breastplate was a place to hide two stones called Urim and Thummim. And these were the stones that the people of Israel would use for divine guidance. Apparently they might cast them like dice. Nobody really knows how this procedure worked, but it was 100% accurate. Anytime they went to the Urim and Thummim, God always gave them the right answer. Now, it was in David's possession. David had just delivered the Kelites from the Philistines. Word had gotten to David that Saul was on the way to get him there. David wondered, will Saul destroy these people if I stay here? And the Lord said yes. David asked for the ephod, this wonderful divine guidance piece of cloth, and he asked, if Saul gets here, will the Kelites turn me over? After all that I've done for them, will they betray me? Will they turn me over to Saul? And David got answered, Yes, they will turn you over. David runs. David had this wonderful gift of conversation with God. He would ask, God would answer. Not so with Saul. Saul probably had a little bit of conversation with God when he first started. But coming to the end of his reign, when God said, I'm going to let David be the king of Israel, Saul didn't want to give up the power like nobody really does. When you're in a position of power, you hate to give it up. The only way he could preserve power was to get rid of David. So he too kind of wondered, God, what should I do? Because at the end of his reign, the Philistines were attacking also another village. And this is the response Saul got. When asking for direction from God, when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord didn't answer him. We crave the experience of David. We dread the experience of Saul. Many times that's what we experience in our prayer life, right? Our prayers and our wishes just seem to fall on deaf ears. We crave the relationship David had with our God. When you look at this, we see that David wanted an upgrade, though. He had this wonderful relationship with God here on this earth where he had asked something from God and God would give him an answer. But he wanted an upgrade. He didn't want to have this conversation on earth. As you can see, he wanted to have that conversation in heaven. This is his wish. If he was to ask for one wish, this was it. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Behold the beauty of the Lord. And to inquire, not on this earth, but I want to inquire in his temple. That's where he wishes to do the conversations with God. Now this, Psalm 27, verse 4. Is this just a promise to David, or is it a promise for all Christians? Will we experience this, or is this just something God promises David? We understand that the scriptures and the promises apply not just to those who lived at the time, but for all people and for all times. This promise stands for us. However... Sometimes to see the beauty, we must go through the path of uncomeliness. A perfect example is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That little baby that Mary held in her arms that was probably really cute and cuddly, 
Everybody just adored it as we all adore little cute babies. Apparently, it didn't grow up to be the most handsome person in the world. Apparently, it didn't grow up to be one of those strong male figures that everyone would say, oh yes, there's the king, there's the Messiah. The prophet Isaiah said that our Messiah is going to look like this. He's going to have no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. We see the pictures of Christ today. But actually, many people are now reconfiguring what a Jesus looked like in line with Isaiah 53. He was not the most handsome guy in the world. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, we see the beauty in Christ because we see who he is. He is not just a man born of Mary. He is God in the flesh. And even though his outward temple may not be the most attractive thing for us as Christians, what and who he is is the most beautiful thing for us as believers. Not only do we see beauty by the Spirit in the person of the uncomely Messiah, but we also see the beauty in the cross. Only by the Spirit can we see beauty in the cross. The world will look at a cross, they will look at a ghastly figure, grotesquely strung up to die. But it is a beautiful thing for us because of what's accomplished there. We see our salvation, our redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. We see the beauty of the cross. Perhaps that is why we sing such words like these on Good Friday. With sacred head now wounded, with grief and shame weighed down, now scornfully surrounded with thorns thine only crown. O sacred head, what glory, what bliss till now was thine, yet though despised and gory, I joy to call thee mine. We see the beauty in the cross. I always find it fascinating that many of the fables throughout the history of the world seem to mimic thoughts in the scriptures. Most of us are familiar with the story of Beauty and the Beast, made so by Disney on film, but it's an old French fable. And in that story, Belle, through sufferings and through pains, eventually sees beauty in the beast. Perhaps the author has something to say about our life with God. That we see beauty in the uncomely sufferings of our own life as God has shown beauty in the past with his own son, Jesus Christ. Maybe we see the beauty of a God and a Savior, Jesus Christ, who doesn't want to necessarily show all his power and majesty and rule, maybe in times of our sorrow, he shows us his compassion. He shows us his care. He shows us in our sorrow that he puts his arm around us and cries with us. Shortest verse in the Bible John chapter 11, Jesus wept. Sometimes Jesus doesn't show us his majesty and beauty by deliverance. He shows us his majesty and beauty by his tears. We know this to be true because Jesus has made this promise, saying to you and to me, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. He doesn't qualify that. He doesn't say, I'm with you only in times of joy. I'm with you always in joy and in sorrow. And through even the uncomeliness of our sorrowful path, we experience the beauty of the Lord, his compassion, his love, 
his support. Today, we are on this side of time, so we are not inquiring in his temple in heaven, but we do inquire here, his church. This is where the ephod is today, the urim and thummim in the breastplate of the high priest in the church. It's called the word and the sacrament. Here in the church, God talks with you. You talk with God as you worship and you pray to him and you inquire of him. Looking forward to the day in which you too with David, because of Christ, will gaze upon his beauty and inquire of him in the heavenly temple. In his name, amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.